Good morning! Let's discuss the minerals from Mogok that have yellowish orange fluorescence, that is scapolite, the different feldspatoids, including hyponite, a variety of sodalites. Here are the numerous questions we'll answer during this presentation. Please press pause if you want to go through them, otherwise I'll just skip and get started without no further ado. I'll pass on the abstract already available online to simply comment on this picture of sodalite cabochon displaying very strong fluorescence and tenebrescence, just as a reminder that most minerals discussed thereafter are turned into jewelry. So here we have a suite of minerals on spatic calcite matrix from Dato, reflecting the diversity of phases and assemblage found in that part of the marble arc. The poorly expressed blue phases are the feldspatoid that exhibit different hues of blues, sometimes white and greenish tinge, associated are with um, phlogopite mica, the ruby and pink sapphires. Scaphalite is present too, mostly scattered in the matrix. The right hand corner has what resemble diopside and an isolated apatite in the upper middle. In long wave, apart from the corundum fluorescing red, there are different levels of orange fluorescence coming from the feldspatoids and scapolites. In short wave UV, it reveals the yellow fluorescence of the phlogopite and the very faint reaction of the feldspatoids. Here is a closer view of the purplish corundum with red fluorescence and the blue feldspatoids. The phlogopite on the right is highlighted in short wave. Um, there is some staining here. Uh, around a phase that hasn't been identified, um, it's not possible to give it a name yet. Sodalite and scapolite are both aluminosilicate with very similar structure. They're made of chains of SiO4 and ILO4 tetrahedra, organized in a cubic system and forming cavities or cages. These cages are big enough to admit one large iron at the center surrounded by tetrahedrons or rings of four alkali quartian and here sodium. The hosted inside is typically an halogenide like chlorine, but the interesting properties arise when substitution occur. So as we're going to see, sulfur is the key element responsible for these interesting properties. Sulfur, but in which form? Feldpatoids can host a variety of polysulfides and sulfoxides, the most common being sulfate, as in Hawin, Lazarite, Ozean, Ozean, but listable phases are also transitorily present. All we really care about today are three of these ions, S2-, 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 S2- and S3-. S2- causes the fluorescent properties of sodalite and scapolite. S2-, S2- causes the photochromism of acmalite. S3- causes the blue color found in your favorite feldspatoids. If we leave alone S3- minus for the moment, it's quite clear that there is much difference between the two others, S2- minus and S22-. Minus. It's only a matter of an extra electron, and yet it's super important. So once upon a time, chlorine ion was mining in ocean life in the cage, but somehow in the melt, a hot disulfide S22- minus caused competition and became surprisingly well assimilated in the aluminosilicate framework. We know the rest of the story. Chloride had to go away, and don't get me wrong, it wasn't easy to keep things balanced in the matrix, a hole was left in the feldspatoid's heart. And that's how vacancies are created. So there are many dumb ways to die, but hopefully today you won't I won't bore you to death by PowerPoint. Here is a short summary of a good paper where the complex modeling of a colored F center involved populating one cell with S22 disulfide, another cell with a vacancy, and the other six cells around filled with the regular six chlorine making for a sodalite supercell. And then we have a look at the different energy levels. The energetic profile of the sodalite is the sum of the elements it's made of. And without going too much into the details, because I think the next talk is going to cover that better, we can just know that there are some powerful excitation that can trigger the electron to leave the S2 2 minus molecule, subsequently becoming S2 minus, with the electron going away and populating the vacancy. The orbitals and bonding properties are changed and with different energy levels, creating an energy gap and thus generating a color center. With the energy provided by the UV radiation, around 4 to 5 electron volts, 250 to 310 nanometers, 
the charge transfer between S2 2 minus and the vacancy occurs and then creating the F center. Once the vacancy is populated with that given electron, a geometrical relaxation of the system induces a large reorganization of the electronic states. If the lifetime of the electron trapped in the vacancy is long enough, an inter-system crossing occurs, leading to a quite stable state in which it can stay trapped for days. It then, it then has quantized energy levels, causing the material to absorb light in the visible range. The trapped electron can then give the purple color to that Hackmanite around 539 nanometers. If you are familiar with energetic diagrams, this one is summarizing the phenomenon. But what about the fluorescence? It's been proven on last year for scapulite that the ion responsible for it was S2 minus. So please read this article and the reference therein for longer explanation about how they modeled and did the calculation for that. Back to mineralogy. Here is the Ackmanite neighboring potassic feldspar. And at the boundary, there is a thin clear strip just there, half a mil wide of deeper purple. Why is that? K feldspar is, among other, made of potassium which is radioactive. And 89% of the potassium 40 will undergo a beta negative decay. That is, the beta minus electrons have no characteristic energy and rarely will make it out of the work. So what? Well, basically, potassium-40 is an electron generator, and it triggers the very same phenomenon than a UV lamp, just without UV. It sends an electron to fill the vacancy and adjusts enough to activate the Hackmanite in the limited range, as you can see in this picture. So how is the daylight color of Hackmanite linked to the intensity of fluorescence? You can see here, fluorescent, dark color, not so much fluorescent, strong purple color. If you missed it, same stuff here, and again, a black face. So the purple color lasts until there is enough energy, should it be white light, ambient light, or heat, for the electron to escape its trap and recombine with the anion, which causes the depletion of the F center over time. So why is it white around that black spot? To answer that, we need to look at why the fluorescence is stronger locally. That uranium thorium bearing black phase decays generating alpha particles. An alpha particle en route is like an atomic bulldozer unperturbed by the electrons is ripping away from the atom it meets along its path. Traveling in a very straight line and at a comparatively low velocity with the electrons, it can force large number of atoms to give up the electrons in a process known as ionization. And what happens when you ionize S2-2-? Well, you kick out an electron of S2-2-, it becomes S2-, and does that remind you something? Exactly, it becomes the fluorescent version of himself. And why is tenebrescent fainter near the uranium-thorium source? Well, if, if the electron is gone, it's gone. You can't remove another spare electron if there are none left. So basically that's what's happening. You could also infer that uh, more disordered or metamixed uh, cages are too loose to hold the electron and trap it long, time, long term. So it's favoring its return path to the anion. There are other um, ideas around, um, but I don't really have the skills to prove them. Should it be the, the length of the cells or, um, or, or the case of self quenching sulfur because um, I haven't done the map of sulfur in there and thermal bleaching is not an option either because um, that other slice of the slab is actually um, still white even though there is no thermal difference. So here is the XRF um, fluorescence graph of thorium and you can see um, it's present in the samples of Hackmanite and there is quite an interesting uh, color graduation, the thorium rich are paler colored than the thorium poor. And if you have a look at uranium, same phenomenon occurs. Or is it because it's actually argon populated there? And argon is the decay uh, daughter element of potassium. So it needs to be verified in here. Uh, the two um, energy levels are very close between the M alpha and of the uranium thorium 
and the k beta of argon but um, it's it's another way of seeing this not on the hand symbol but in the spectra um, what about the persistent bluish white luminescence we can also see when um, exposing the samples to shortwave UV. Um, it lasts a few seconds and there are uh, a few pieces of literature saying it's assigned to some orbital transition along lead, thallium, tin and antimony. I haven't done the elemental maps but I've analyzed with the XRF and even lead is sometimes present. I can't really um, say that it seems to be the main source of fluorescence across all the, mean, the, the cabochons I've analyzed. Uh, zinc and arsenic seems to be a, a good guess too. Tin is nothing and no thallium or antimony either. They're just not there. Um, there's another theory explaining why there is some bluish white luminescence which is persistent. Um, some titanium substitution and oxygen vacancy, that's the deal. None of my cabochons are displaying um, that, that, that are displaying strong luminescence have notable titanium contents. The phenomenon could pretty much only require electrons finding their way to the oxygen vacancy and the beta minus radiation from potassium 40 could be the perfect generous donator for that. And for the sake of it, if I keep listing the other luminescence found in these samples, I must mention that I've got that undetermined uranium thorium aluminosilicate that triggers similar orange fluorescence in long wave by emitting alpha particles ripping off electrons of S2 2 minus. But the interesting property um, of introducing some uranyl ions and a very green fluorescence in short wave um, and same persistent luminescence. So, why isn't there more data about the Burmese Hackmanite? Well, not everyone has the chance to have been there and gain direct sources to the material. It costs a fair bit, believe me, to acquire an import 15 kg parcel like this one to yield only a few specks of those very interesting minerals. One does not simply walk into Mogul. And that may explain why the literature is so focused in using synthetic material instead. No hassle in acquiring the material, plus you can fairly easily tune which and how much impurity you want in. And by doing so, there is no bad surprise from extra interaction caused by natural source of radiation. And that's you can see in this article from 2021, where chlorine has been substituted with bromine and iodine, and the result has completely different color. And in my natural samples, you can see the peak for bromine is actually quite high, so we do have a elevated level of bromine in natural samples too. Yet, the intensity of the sulfur peak isn't high enough to confirm the anti-correlation. Okay, so that's the valley of Mogok where the samples are coming from. So, the marble hosted ones are coming from Dato here, and the Seinite with the Hackmanite is coming from PNG, Pianpit. Um, that's another map showing you the different extents of um, the ruby bearing marbles and the calc silicate rocks that we are finding in here with the scan and um, intrusions. On this map you can see where the road stops for foreigners that can't access the paint pit area. So you won't see uh, pictures of this place because I haven't been myself, even though I've been in other places in Mogok. So um, what about the age of the marble hosted uh, ruby deposits um, from Mogok? Well, this occurrence is located close to major tectonic features from during Himalayan orogenesis directly in such a zone from the Himalayas or in the shear zone that guided the extrusion of the Siamese Indochina block during the tertiary collision of the Indian plate with the Eurasian plate. The feldspathoid occurrence are contained within platform carbonate series that underwent high grain metamorphism and are specially related to granitoid intrusions. How do we know the mineralization dates from Miocene? Well, first, phlogopite crystals are isolated, and then, a few moments later, we can tell that the minimum age for argon retention in the phlogopite associated with the ruby feldspathoid marbles are dated some 18 million years after the condition of ruby crystallization were first met. Some work could be done on phlogopite from other parogenesis, the one with hackmanite, to see the cyanite got in place at about the same period. So what's the role for organic matter in enabling the reduction of sulfate to S2- the, um, 
the iron we know is triggering the fluorescence. Well, I haven't found any remnants of graphite around. So either all the graphite from the organic matter got turned into CO2, or maybe there just wasn't much in the first place, and there is another way to reduce sulfur. That's what we're going to see. And how could the meta-evaporite lenses in protholith explain the presence of sulfate in chloride minerals? We'll have a look at that. So um, only a few of these uh, prepared uh, samples were analyzed yet. Um, let's focus on them. So that's what the mounts were looking like. We isolated the really nice pure faces um, to have some quantitative mineralogy of these. And some of the positively identified minerals that we got in that cyanide assemblage include mostly scapolite, um, and that's the marilite type, so the sodic one, clinochlor, phlogopite, hackmanite, obviously, and then minor accessories like drivite. So this is what the graph looks like. The spectra acquired have a very, very significant result for Hackmanite with one of a kind uh, pattern, completely different to that of the scapulite, even though it's sharing most of the same elements. Um, and based on that, we had semi-quantitative uh, chemical indication for the natural of the mineral. This hexagonal crystal of phlogopite mica is very clean and homogeneous to the contrary of the Hackmanite which actually happens to be a mix of different phases that the backscattered electron microscopy can identify as being calcite, twin plagioclase, and only a speck of sodalite. Um, all of these coexist together um, by assimilation of kaolinite and albite in the halite and dolomite sedimentary matrix with bits of water and potassium sulfate that are turning into phlogopite sodalite calcite and a CO2 rich fluid with some reduced sulfide from the sulfate. Um, these are not just two minerals. Um, I thought it was just a corona and interesting stuff. Actually, it's so much more than that. Um, it's not a simple phase, it's complexity that rocks because you've got all of those blue specks of lazurite that is fluorescent and the long wave and short wave, and yet has lots of relief variation. You can tell it's quite complex. And under the SEM, the simplex texture is even more obvious with microscopic intergrowth of two or actually more uh, different phases that are replacing uh, a coarse grain reactant assemblage um, in that um, retrograde metamorphic reaction uh, of metastable products. Um, let's have a look at uh, the simple ticked here in details. So here you've got um, a mix of magnesium rich diopside with a corona reacting with a feldspathoid and potassium feldspar. In this one, the potassium feldspar has been weathered into clay, likely hamogolite, which is aluminium and silica bearing and about that's it. And the first part of it here is actually closer to hyoin or lazurite. And we still have that ogite or magnesium rich uh, dioxide. So how come they are together? Well, if we consider the first part can dismutate into nepheline and silica, that given silica can actually react with dolomite to turn into dioxide with a good ratio. And um, we can end up with another few equations to this mass balance saying that feldspar, albite, the potassium feldspar, albite, kaolinite, dolomite, gypsum, and a bit of water and some sulfate can generate the lazurite, phlogopite, calcite, and diopside that we see in the mineral assemblage with a fluid rich in CO2 and once again reduced sulfur in the form of H2S that can then give the coloration and fluorescent properties to the rock we love. Um, another example here of this time nepheline being present is still the very same rock and from one side to another it's all of these different mineral phases all together. I wish I could give it a simple name. It's actually a mix of different species. So that's the equation. And you can sometimes preserve the diopside uh, original shape from the prograde metamorphism when all of these uh, carbonate were assimilated in the melt.
just enjoy the pictures it's really nice and here you've got the weathering of the clay um, from the feldspar tweed that is not resisting much to the, the tropical climate of Mogok. It's even visible under regular optic microscope. It is really gorgeous. These might be actually remnants of um, uh, amphibolites. Um, I'm not too sure if these um, amphiboles they don't look like anymore. So um, the origin of the feldspatoids are small irregular bodies in the marginal zone of Mogok marbles near the contact with Sainite can be explained by the local silica assimilation in sedimentary limestone and evaporite and those last two into the original mate, melt. Um, so this location of the alkalized feldspar in leucogranite or cyanite in the contact with the marble can result in nepheline and the limestone held minerals presented before. Um, that's how you form sodalite, which is the hackmanite, which is the one we care about. A bit of halbite going and meeting the halite and the dolomite, generating CO2 and the side product is dioxide. For the scapolite, it's actually even easier. Just have some potassium feldspar to start with. We still see them at the end. Some halite, and here you go. You've got the marialite, which is the sodic pole of um, of the scapolite, and it's somewhat similar for the meonite. Just start with anorthite. So the evaporites are the source of sulfur, and that's how you can create all those sulfate-bearing minerals, uh, like the cancrinite that we've got too. So um, I wanted to do a bit more of geochemistry and for that I acquired some data using X-ray fluorescence um, and the data is quite limited because you don't have all of those lightweight elements like sodium which is a major issue because all the rocks are super sodic. Um, yet um, we can tell a few things about uh, what we get especially if we run the statistic to get some principal component analysis. Um, so obviously if you plot that in the right diagram you see that the rocks are strongly spiraluminous and they are not coming from meta shells or meta sandstone they are not silicic enough that's proven to by another graph from the literature where all the hackmanite and feldspatoid and how are plotting along this region which belongs to a, a protholith typical of a kaolinite rich claystone much further from the seal stone and sandstone And um, if you run principal component analysis, you'll see that the salt have made possible uh, chromophoric elements like vanadium and titanium to be captured in the melt. And um, the melt itself is actually uh, quite differentiated because the niobium component of it is, is quite strong. And automatic clustering is good enough to pick up how the hackmanite is different from the other kind of feldspathoids. Um, but uh, the limited quality of the data prevents from digging any more into that kind of stuff. So if we decipher what the protodith looked like, um, because we can't trust the data, we have to actually build up um, the end result. So trust me on these numbers. That's my estimation of what we had at the end. That's the final assemblage. And if we actually check the chemistry of that, synthetic chemistry, um, we can actually run the solver on Excel, and that's the end result that is getting spit. So we start with mostly calcite, 90%, a speck of gypsum, a speck of dolomite, 2% uh, of halite, and 6% kaolinite, and that's good enough to give us more the mineral assemblage we are seeing in Dato. That's enough to generate uh, the feldspar is there. Um, if we go for the other mineral assemblage, um, we can actually assume that this is the final composition. Trust me on this once again. Um, and the final assemblage being that, we can calculate how much silica, aluminium, and so on is present in that hackneyed foil. And then back calculate how much clay and other elements we need in the original protholith. And we can then do the resolution by assuming that all the sulfur is coming from the, from the sulfate in gypsum and then undergoing the thermal reduction we've discussed before. 
likely with some addition of organic matter interaction and oxidal reduction. Only 2.4% of gypsum is required though. To honor the estimated 10% of, of uh, sodium in the mineral assemblage at the end, well, there is a need to have at least 25% highlight to start with. Um, and there is enough sodium in the clay stone. So we end up uh, with a chlorine excess compared to what is left over in the pyrogenesis. And we undertook like likely 12% loss overall of devolatilization. It's possible to constrain to 100%. But then, even though the silica of aluminium ratio is correct, there won't be enough silicium and aluminium in the final pyrogenesis, unless we assume some extra input from another peralkaline melt. Um, and what if don't, we don't have that 10 or 12 percent of dolomite? Um, well, we're missing 90 percent of the magnesium later hosted in the phlogopite, as claystone is not very magnesium rich. So this should be rejected. Uh, calcite has to be present and so we for sure have like 7 to 12 percent carbonate to start with and regardless of which carbonate it is we end up with more carbon than what we actually need so we once again we can assume that there is some co2 devolatilization during the process um, we can't really look for the oxygen calculation because we don't really have straight data for, for that so basically that's the estimated mineral assemblage to start with in protholith of the sienite, a speck of calcite and dolomite, the sum of which um, should be around 12%, a quarter of halite by mass, 90% um, claystone, 12% kaolinite, 2.4% gypsum to give the sulfate that then trigger the fluorescence and the color changing properties, with some of the loss of volatiles to make 148% of voidite, um, which is a really, really interesting rock. What a dense journey was it uh, through that of the fluorescent photon. We've covered the role of sulfur and of the other elements, the influence of radioactivity and the vacancies, and the other geochemical reaction of the melt with evaporite and carbonate across different scales. Do you have any questions?